Okay, on behalf of RIC, Institute for Gender Equality and Difference, and the Gender Equality Studies and Training Program, the guest program at the Un University of Iceland, I want to welcome you all to the fourth session of the 2021 Spring Term Conversation Series, titled Race, Immigration, History and Contemporary Feminist Activism. My name is Elin Björk and I'm a project manager at RIC. Today's speakers are Marai Larasi and Nicole Lee Mosby. Marai Larasi is an advocate, community organizer, consultant and educator. And Nicole Lee Mosby is the director of the Multicultural and Information Center in Iceland, or Fjölmenninga Center for those who speak Icelandic. So the topic of the series uh, is Me Too, Thinking Ahead. And it follows up on two recent books on Me Too. So firstly is the fifth issue in Rick's book series, Fletter, which is in Icelandic and is edited by me, Thorgerður Thoraldsdóttir and Kristin Pálsdóttir. And Nicole Lee Mosby has an article in Fletter about solidarity, women of foreign origin and the Me Too movement in Iceland. And secondly is the Rotlitz Handbook of the Politics of the Me Too Movement, edited by Irma Erlingsdóttir, director of Rick and Gast, and Giti Chandra, research specialist at Gast. And Marai Lorassi has a chapter in the handbook entitled Black Women, Me Too and Resisting Plantation Feminism. And Giti Chandra will be moderating the discussion here today. And we will start with short inputs from our speakers to set the tone for the conversation and discussion and participants, uh, the audience participants can send in their questions in the chat here on Zoom or in comments on Facebook Live. So I'll hand the word over to you, Nicole. Thank you. Uh, what an honor to, to be a part of this, uh, to be a part of, uh, been able to honor to work with me too, um, uh, an honor to have uh, been able to write in the, in the book and, uh, and speaking here today. And in all honesty, uh, how do I say this without sounding ridiculous, but what an honor to be an immigrant, to um, had to have uh, learned through certain adversities. When you, when you look at me, you might not think, you know, who is this woman and why is she speaking about vulnerabilities and solidarity, a white girl from, from the United States? Because when I moved to Iceland, I um, became and was told that I was an immigrant and that I was less and that uh, I had an uphill battle to, to travel and I've done so. Um, and I'd like to illustrate some of the uh, multiple vulnerabilities and types of abuse that foreign women experience here in Iceland. People, you know, we think of Iceland as this gender equality paradise, but um, through my work and advocacy and my own experiences and those of my friends and coworkers, we experience isolation, perceived vulnerabilities, let me save you, let me talk down to you, let me forget the fact that you are a you know, beautiful, intelligent, powerful woman. Here, you know, you don't speak this language, you don't know how we do things or how we want things to be. Uh, they've been targeted for violence, abuse, physical, mental, and societal, being told you have a position. Not everyone, let's be clear, not everyone experiences this, but far, far too many. Uh, discrimination, based on origin, language, race, religion, um, and position in society. Degradation, education ignored, cultural trivial, tr cultures trivialized, or even worse, we're kind of cute sometimes. Rejection, that's another thing. Gender equality versus genuine equality is something we speak about regularly. When we, when we look at um, the, the, the lower, paying jobs, they're filled with women of foreign origin, and there's not a clear upward mobility path, things like this. Societal prowess versus a loss of sense, a loss of self, professional or community or familial status are things that women experience when they move here, far too many. Uh, we're always hearing about a need for empowerment, but we need to be clear about the fact that empowerment that is genuine is built on the power of solidarity. And the empowerment is genuine when it comes from within a community and based on our needs and our ideas within that community, rather than based on the perceived idea of the majority, meaning Icelanders can't decide how it should be for us. They need to listen to us about how we feel empowerment is about how we feel about what we've experienced. 
uh, and of course men. I mean, that's not just uh, men need to understand this. Often we think that we know that women of foreign origin need this or want this or how, what they should do in order to achieve success. For example, we need to, I've heard this many times, we need to re-educate ourselves. We need to be satisfied with the status that we are allowed to have. And I become enraged a lot of times when I hear that. Um, when I came here, I had a certain education. I no longer do that. I did go to school for another profession because I had been put in another role. And I have climbed into a, a different role, but let's be clear about it. When I moved here 20 years ago, I didn't even understand that I was an immigrant. I didn't even know what that meant to be. And now I had an agency. I had it with passion and, and, and with a vision to help support other immigrants. Um, to get a little bit into the vulnerabilities, I'd just like to make it very clear that women who decide to pick up their lives for whatever reason it be, love, education, just the fact that it's I'm absolutely beautiful to be here. Um, maybe the fact that there's an opportunity for a better life, or maybe the fact that they're willing to take a step backwards from the life they currently know in order to simplify things and move across the globe to live in Iceland should never be considered vulnerable. We should never be considered less because the decision in and of itself requires courage and strength. And I think that that's something that needs to be very clear about every woman who comes here. And we all need to start from that basis. This woman has made a conscious decision with these people, whoever, that uh, they're here to do something and they need a pathway. And solidarity, that's all of our responsibility. Um, things that occur once we relocate to Iceland can make us vulnerable, not of our own doing necessarily. Iceland is considered, again, a leader in the world when it comes to gender equality. But reality has shown us that women of multi-ethnical origin do not always experience that same equality as our Icelandic sisters. Many instances were not afforded enough protection or information from gender-based violence and discrimination under the law in our workplaces or within various institutions that are the very institutions that are designed to support equality and our sense of security. Women of multi-ethnic origin can experience gender-based violence and discrimination in many contexts, as we found through our work with Me Too um, and the testimonials that came from us in 2018. Perpetrators of violence include close relations, familial or intimate par partners, which oftentimes people shuffle under the rug because they feel it's just a part of our culture or something we are willing to accept. Uh, cultural acquaintances, people within uh, our own um, ethnic origins who are maybe not related to us, but uh, they create a sense of vulnerability and, and opportunity for themselves. Uh, people have been abused by employers, co-workers, people who are completely unknown to us, as was my case, and the very symptoms that people are charged that are charged with protecting us because systemic violence isn't just that you've been perpetrated, it's that you're continually perpetrated and not empowered. We also found that women's vulnerabilities uh, to violence uh, they continue to be uh, enhanced by this in institutional or administrative structures. Um, in far too many instances, women of foreign origin uh, have expressed uh, that we experience that we have fewer choices or opportunities. And how are we to persist and prosper here when we feel like we come up upon doors that are closed? And those doors are closed to us based on what language, the color of our skin, our origins, a lack of belief in our strengths. Um, women experience struggles with discrimination and exclusion while finding the strength to adjust to our new lives in Iceland. So it's kind of like a, a double whammy, always telling ourselves that, you know, that we're strong and we can do this and we're going to do this, slam, another door, slam, abuse. Some of the stories that came from, from women in Me Too, it just, uh, it just felt like they couldn't get a break. They couldn't get away from the very people who were set to protect them. They held them down while they kept finding the strength to just live. Um, language discrimination is a very powerful weapon, something that people do not realize. It, uh, it takes away a person's sense of self. You, you're a grown adult with grown thoughts. You know what you're thinking about, you know what you're doing, and you're making this huge courageous decision to learn this, this language, Icelandic, 
whom everyone tells you, by the way, is the most difficult language you're ever going to learn. Whether that's true or not, it's up to the learner, is what I'd like to believe. Uh, but it's a powerful weapon because it's used to hold people who have knowledges and strengths and ideas out of positions where they can use those strengths and ideas. Um, many women describe the fact that maybe they don't get uh, even a job interview just because of their name. And it's assumed that their language skills are going to be low. Um, it's, uh, yeah, women describe being, having a language to hold them in a lower position in society where they're not afforded the same upward mobility in the job market. For example, as our Icelandic sisters, the same language discrimination has also been used in abusive situations to keep some of us uninformed or misinformed about our rights. And this came up a lot in Me Too, where people were told things. You don't need to do that. You, don't, you can't do that. You have to stay with your abuser. Uh, women who look to us for support and counseling or uh, at women in Iceland, they often describe experiences of discrimination which impact their feeling of value and the utter possibility of empowerment. And that right there is, is, is something that has to be stopped. No woman should be made to feel that she has no value or less value than another and that she doesn't even have access to the possibilities of, of going somewhere else, doing something more. Within Me Too testimonials, there were many instances of women who were held in a position where they felt undignified and powerless. This doesn't happen in a, in a society where solidarity, where we work together to lift each other up, to make space for each person's voice. Whether we respect that voice or not, doesn't matter. There needs to be space for it. Um, and again, like I, I will say it again and again, it's usually based solely on origin, cultural aspects, or color of skin. Instances where women have been forced uh, to work or live in conditions they would otherwise never agree to. For example, women who were provided accommodation in relation to their work uh, in the tourism industries. Uh, they became exposed to discrimination, sexual assault, violence, and even human trafficking, where they were expected to pay for their accommodation through a sex or you know, living with discrimination and, and degradation. Um, into, in addition to this, the multi-ethnic women of multi-ethnic origins are also faced uh, with economic insecurities, which may result in violence against them or cause them to take risks that they wouldn't do otherwise. Um, you'll see um, women of foreign origin, they inhabit lower paying rungs in the job field with tourism, cleaning hotels um, and otherwise. And, when they and they'll work long hours, they'll take shifts, they take risks to put them in situations. And and women, a lot of women of foreign origin here, they don't have this amazing uh, woman um, contextualized, when you want to say, support network. We did a survey recently uh, where we asked who was your your support network. The majority of the answers came from immediate family. That would be, and I described that as as your husband or your parents. So if the abuse is happening there, and that's your support network, what do you have then? The further we reached out into society with our question, it went to immediate family, and then a larger family, which would be cousins or, or however you would define that. And that was just a, a few more. And then um, next, it was people of the same origin or other foreigners. And when we got into things like, um, Social workers, very few said that they found them to be a support network. Um, authorities, very few found that to be. Healthcare workers, some people wrote in maybe a psychologist, but there were very few answers. Religious uh, sections or, or grassroots organizations, people didn't find those to be anything that would support them. So this is something that when we talk about solidarity, we need to realize all of these entities play a role. Um, now I've gone off track. How many minutes do I have left in my seven? Gotta be getting close to the end, right? I okay. You can take, yeah, it's it's 17 past 12, but you can take another five minutes, I think, which will be fine. Um, recent study in the tourist industry exposed information about foreign workers, many of them women working irregularly, in some cases without proper instruction uh, as to their rights. That's a really big thing here. We're gonna talk about solidarity. Iceland is a country that has just an amazing set of resources and access to rights. 
And I mean, it was just <laughs> deemed that we couldn't put people in a, in, a, in a hotel to keep us from getting COVID because we have such strong rights. Um, and also had to do with the way the laws were written. But a lot of women who move here are not told about their rights and they're not given access to their rights. And in many instances, they're denied their rights. And then, uh, I mean, I know I, <laughs> the first four years I lived here, I didn't know I had a right to have a doctor. No one told me. And I didn't think to ask. I just went always to the emergency room. Um, women of multi-ethnic origin who are victims of violence, insecurity is often reinforced by the lack of protection defined by the law. Um, and this has to do a lot with residence permits and work permits. People are tied to the very entities that uh, are not providing them with their rights, their, their, their access to escape, access, you know, a, a, an access to getting away from those risks and, and satisfying themselves with taking a lower position or living in a situation that they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, there are ways out, but uh, not always do people have access to it. People not always uh, allow translators. Think about that, that basic right. It's not defined in law everywhere in Iceland that you have the right to a translator to help you to understand fully, you know, what you can do to protect yourself and to, you know, be empowered. Um, women's vulnerability, vulnerability is exemplified oftentimes uh, through either improper or no access to information, as I had said, systemic holding down or creating unnecessary vulnerabilities. Is, that's my take on that. Women have looked to our organization for assistance and support, and they're often distressed because they've gone through many rings. They've looked for advice from friends or coworkers or something, and they just don't know what to do. And some of the examples that I pulled together uh, when they're attempting to leave an abusive relationship or, or an employment situation where their rights have been, uh, have been impeded on or they have been abused. Um, while going through divorce and custody cases, people uh, experience abuse from the system uh, being held from not only their rights, but, but just a, a sense of, of, of no power, no, no, no options. Um, people have also uh, come to us looking for answers because they felt like they've been abused or, or made more vulnerable by looking for assistance at social affairs having to work with child protective services um, and the officers there uh, looking to the police for uh, going through, uh, um, looking for their rights if they've been sexually abused, they, they don't feel supported. Uh, filing taxes, that's a, a strange one, but people has, have come up with it. I just don't get the information I need and, and, uh, and, and they don't want to help me. They don't want to help me. And that, that's uh, the, just for anyone to say that, that no one wants to help them. It's just that's something you don't, that doesn't exist in a society where we talk about gender equality. Um, dealing with legalities related to work and residence permits and dealing with school authorities uh, or bullying or discri discrimination issues. People don't necessarily feel at times like the support that's supposed to be there, that's both the support that's designed and, and, and described in policy, it doesn't adhere to them. Um, in many instances, we had found that these women, uh, they're not afforded translators, as I've mentioned, uh, they're given information that they don't understand, or they're simply given incorrect information. Um, and this is something that holds people vulnerable. And it sometimes forces women just to give up, just to take it. And that's not something we want in a society where <laughs> equality is our, is our quality, is our goal, is our mission. Um, women find themselves um, in situations which call for great strength, but they're left to feel extremely vulnerable, isolated, and intimidated. And that's something I think we all need to think about because we all have a role to play. Um, this little, little woman here, I, I understand I have a role to play, whether it be with my neighbor, with another parent where my children go to school, whether it be in my role now at this agency or in my role in my grassroots work, we all have a role to play. I can't necessarily change the systems, but I can definitely be heard as to what's needed. Um, it angers me to have to say that all too often women will either stay in or return to abusive situations that they're trying to flee from 
or get assistance with. And when I say abusive situations, I'm not just talking about gender-based violence. I'm talking about these situations that I've highlighted here that are systemic. Uh, women's feelings of vulnerability become magnified through gender and racial discrimination. In many instances, women might become secluded, leaving them to believe that violence and discrimination against them is neither recognized or taken seriously, meaning they are not. Many women express uh, spousal violence that was not treated seriously by police or healthcare workers, school administrators, or child protective services. Um, it's an age-old story, nothing indicative of Iceland, but something that we can change here. Um, all of the things that I talk about are real examples. Um, they're things, um, they're examples of how women are made vulnerable and not of our own doing. Um, and I want to address the fact that um, I was recently called out due to the fact that I'm, I'm uh, now in a position of privilege and the color of my skin has never worked against me. This is true. This is very fair. There are certain discriminations that I haven't experienced, but I understand the role we all have to play in creating a society where solidarity, the, the, the wealth of information and empowerment belongs to all of us. Um, I can assure you that in my 20 years here, I've experienced uh, many of these struggles and vulnerabilities uh, that I've talked about, including sexual violence based on the fact that I'm foreign, uh, discrimination baked, based on my lack of knowledge or perceived lack of knowledge due to language, uh, cheated out of certain rights, not explained to my certain rights, uh, outright abuse based on my origin and language abilities. Uh, so I speak of a, uh, from a position where I understand and I want to change it. Uh, every single woman who moves here can easily be targeted. If I can, anyone can, um, to the varied forms of abuse, harassment and sexual abuse. Uh, not because they're vulnerable by nature, but because we walk into an environment where these things live. They haven't been eradicated. And we have to believe that the means of protection and support are uh, just as available to us and open to us as our Icelandic sisters and or brothers uh, and in truth that they're limited. Uh, what can we do to change this? The more we include women of multi-ethnic origin in discussions and decision-making regarding how we see gender equality uh, with them as leaders and not receivers. That's the thing. Eradication doesn't happen when it's done for us. It has to be, we have to be a part of it. Our voices have to be at the table, not only listened to, but acted upon. Um, this can only happen through solidarity. Uh, we listen to and act together. We bring genuine equality needed for an empowered society where genuine equality exists. When society as a whole learns to place value on our voices and our ideas while utilizing the strength and determination of the, these women of foreign origin who moved here, we'll become to know uh, we will come to know a more dynamic, inclusive, and genuine society where equality is the empowerer. And I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. I think there's just so much in there to think about, and I hope we can come back to a lot of these ideas. I have certainly noted some I would love to come back to, um, but I'm going to give the floor to Marai. And Marai, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Giti. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole, for starting us off. Um, can I just check if everybody's hearing me okay? Um, yeah, okay, awesome. So, um, ancestral and warrior greetings, everyone. I am in the mountains of Jamaica, and um, it feels particularly poignant to be having this conversation with you. The first time um, I came to Iceland, I was you know, kind of hanging out with sisters at Stigamot. And I remember that kind of got having taken a walk with Gudrun and speaking about the connection between my mountain here and and, and her mountain there um, in Reykjavik. So, um, and, and the fact that bauxite mining, the mining for bauxite and the, the harm to the land is also a very real thing on the land here in Jamaica. So we have multiple connections. I want to start by really attending to um, some of what uh, Nicole already pointed to, which is this idea of a country that rightfully, in many ways, prides itself on gender equality, right? So 
Iceland in many ways is the poster child for, for what gender equality could look like. And we see conversations in so many different spaces. Iceland is often pulled out in meetings that I'm attending as the place that you, you really could, you know, should think about in terms of gender, gender equality. And I'm always struck by how that feels like one version of gender equality, right? So who is the gender equality for? So when we have conversations, in many ways, part of the challenge to our feminist activism is when we speak about gender equality, like who are we speaking about? Like who's included in this idea of gender equality and who is excluded? Is it gender equality for me if I look a particular way? Is it gender equality for me if I actually am part of a much more elite homogenous group in any nation? Is it gender equality for me if I'm non-disabled? Is it gender equality for me if, for example, I'm heterosexual as opposed to anybody who's LGBTQI? Is it gender equality for me if I'm a white woman or if I'm a particular type of white woman? Woman, what are we talking about when we, when we talk about, when we fight in, in our feminist activism for a single version of gender equality? Should that be the thing that we are saying? Should that be the only thing that we are saying? we are fighting for in our struggles for equality and justice. Because for me, the challenge with, with, with not naming the thing, the challenge with not exploring what it means to, in, and in, 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 in my chapter in, in, um, in the Me Too Handbook, you know, I speak about like really excavating those ruptures, right? Because if we don't name the differences, if we don't name the hierarchies between us, then the equality will only ever be something that is focused on the most privileged and the most elite woman in any movement and in any society. And we have all these multiple lines of injustice, all these multiple lines of inequality that are rooted in our histories that we don't wish to speak about. Now, one of the things that happens, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, start with the C word, which um, is, is not a swear word, except in some, some context. I want to talk about colonialism because one of the things that is interesting for me is how people love to go, but I come from a country that didn't colonize anybody. And I'm like, yeah, but here's the thing. You benefit from the colonial, from the European colonial project because the European colonial project gave us these ideas of power based on whiteness, power based on white supremacy, the European colonial project gave us these ideas of a group of people that are the right people and a group of people that are not the right people. The idea of the problematic other, the noble or the ignoble savage. So like, you know, Nicole, you spoke about kind of, you know, like the sense of arriving in Iceland and then being other, right? Like mm -hmm. that, 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 like this experience suddenly, and, and I hear people say that to me all the time, like actually, oh my God, like I've lived my life with this kind of sense of like, I'm just, I'm just getting on with my life. Usually when people, you know, like usually when people are, are kind of protected in some ways, right? Like there's this idea of buoyancy, like what gives you buoyancy? What gives you protection in a society and what can actually shift that? And very often arrival into another country, particularly if you've not arrived in that, into that country with a certain kind of positioning and placement. So around language, around ethnicity, you know, around sexuality, around a whole host of things. There is immediately this, this harm that is being done that's rooted in this idea of othering. And some of what I want us to think about is how the European colonial project, some of, so much of that rests in the European colonial project, the way that borders are now defined the way that we are so obsessed with immigration control. That wasn't like a random project. Like migration is a completely normal thing. Mass migration is usually linked to poverty, exclusion, harm being done, the ways that, you know, kind of European nations and their allies will actually cause disruption in another state. And when people end up in a country seeking refuge, then those people are problematized. 
And so for me, part of what we have to do with our feminism, if we are to build this solidarity, and Nicole, I really like this idea of us thinking through what would meaningful solidarity look like. We can't have meaningful solidarity without really naming the yucky stuff that comes between yeah. us. I cannot be, I cannot be, as, as, as a cis woman, I cannot be ally to my trans siblings without having to attend to the points and places where actually I don't ever have to think about how I move through space. Mm -hmm. I don't ever have to think about the kind of questions that I, I am asked. I cannot be an ally to my disabled sisters, my sisters without disabilities as a non-disabled woman if I am not accountable for and responsible around the ways in which the world is designed around aspects of this body and aspects of this particular mind, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, this for me, part of the conversation around race and around racial justice is like if my white sisters aren't willing to look at the different points, the different ruptures that exist between us that are rooted in colonization, there can be no solidarity. We can hang out. We can do some good work together, but we are not going to dismantle the systems. And, you know, Nicole, you spoke about systems and kind of leadership within those spaces. Like, here's the thing, like I'm old school, I'm a particular kind of old school feminist. So I'm like, I want the system dismantled. <laughs> That's, that's what I'm up for, because I, I've descended from people that only are here because the systems, in mm. and the systems re reform themselves, you know, like it's an ongoing thing, it's like a hydra. But some of what we have to be mindful of is all systems are held in place by individual people. Mm. There's no kind of, the, the, you know, the, notion, the binary of the micro and the macro, we really need to attend to because we're holding the macro inside us all the time. And we're either contributing to or we're disrupting the system. So I'm like, let's choose. In moment to moment, to moment let us choose. Like there is a way that we, we do need to get into the system and mess it up and, you know, change stuff around and reform. And there are also times when we need to go actually, this is not a system that was designed with me in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, the Eurocentric justice systems were not designed with black women in mind. Mm -hmm. And worryingly, the Eurocentric justice systems have been exported. So Giti originates in India. The Eurocentric justice systems, Giti, I know that they're there. They're here in Jamaica. Like the European colonial project, ex you know, like it sent it nastiness all over the planet and we are still living with that in terms of the harms that is still being done to us and when we talk about geopolitics we sometimes don't attend to the ways even in country of origin we are still being subjugated by systems that are mm -hmm. part of the legacy of the european colonial project right mm -hmm. the way that racisms have been constructed on u.s soil are directly linked to the European colonial project. Yeah. You know, my, my, my colleague Rochelle McPhee always kind of draws, gets us to draw attention between, for example, slave patrols and the policing that led to the killing of George Floyd or yeah. Breonna Taylor, right? Like right. there is something where we have to attend to how those historical legacies continue to reshape who we are mm -hmm. in our wider imagination and who we are in ourselves. If we don't connect those dots between us, we, like I said, we can hang out. We can have very fluffy relationships. It can be cool. I am highly trained in working with my white sisters, but I'm also exhausted from working with my white sisters <laughs> who don't see me in my entirety yeah. and who also aren't willing to address those power dynamics. I'm tired. I haven't got tissues enough for white women's tears anymore. I haven't got enough bosoms to feed any more white women who are in the place of guilt, etc. I'm like, bring your revolutionary spirit and bring it in allyship and solidarity with me. And that involves you doing some work because I don't expect my disabled sisters to do work for me mm -hmm. around my ableist attitude. That's my work. Mm -hmm. when, when, when they're being generous with me and they correct me or they call me in or call me out, that's a gift, right? So when I have conversation with a white woman and I'm like, yo sis, fix yourself up. 
<laughs> that needs to be read as I care enough to give you the time of day to have yeah. you attend to your crap. Not yeah. let me now cry and be like, actually now Mara I is being disruptive in terms of the movement. Yes, I am. But that's not an antagonism that isn't rooted in revolutionary love. For us to have the feminist revolutions that we actually need, those revolutions need to be intersectional. They need to understand different points of pain. They need to understand how in different ways we benefit from the oppression of the other and how the other was constructed in the mm -hmm. first place. I come on, on these, these islands of the Caribbean. I come from a family that is a rural middle-class family. I exist and benefit in so many ways from that class privilege. When I'm here, I feel it, right? And when I'm here, I have to attend to it. There is no point in me pretending that that access and that privilege doesn't exist. Yeah. We all need to intervene the sites of power and the sites of powerlessness that we hold within our own body, right? Yeah. And there are ways sometimes in feminism and in our activism that we can only attend to the places where we experience oppression. I want us to attend to the places where we know that we hold power and privilege, even if we don't always feel it and see it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's what solidarity would and should look like. For me, solidarity is pure revolutionary love. But revolutionary love is not something that actually doesn't attend to the pain. Revolutionary love demands that we attend to the pain and it demands that we create space to heal separately and together. And it demands that we constantly go forward and backward and look at actually yeah. what do we need to what do we need to attend to? That's what revolutionary love looks like. So I'm gonna shut up now and we can, yeah. <laughs> we, can have, we, can have, we can have the conversation instead of yeah. just kind of talking. Wow, um, never shutting up, not shutting up, just, yeah. Uh, thank you to both of you. This is amazing to start out with. I don't think that I need to say very much. I think you've already started this conversation. So I'm going to let the two of you uh, just carry on that conversation and I'll intervene with questions if necessary. Uh, you, Mariah, it, I agree. It would be awesome to hear, yeah. sorry Nicole, uh, can I just say yeah. one thing? It'd be yeah. also awesome to hear from the audience, from yeah. people that are Absolutely. here. And, yeah, yeah. Sorry Nicole. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I totally agree with you and I think, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, have helped me in, in order to understand, you know, you, you can go into a, a place of, of denial but it's, you have to check yourself all the time. Who, who the hell am I? And you know, it opens you up to being able to accept other people and, and, and wanting to, to know about someone else's situation, their history there, because you don't know. I mean, the best, the best thing that, that happened to me was I, I worked for a, a while as a, as a principal. And in my school, we had 80% uh, families of foreign origin from all kinds of places, all kinds of situations, economically, personally, religious, all kinds of things. And I was, I mean, I, I've never learned as much about how stupid I am <laughs> as to the world. No, seriously, I mean, there are just all kinds of things that happen in the world. We live in these bubbles. How much I, I, I learned and I grew and, and how much, this is, this is like the first ideas of solidarity when I, when I start to learn about the importance of it. If you're not gonna open yourself up and be vulnerable and admit that you're faulted as a human being because of some of the privileges you've had, and that you're stronger for meeting adversity and for being open to learning other things about other people and other situations. I mean, that's your revolution right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there is something around how we, we, the moment when we start to go, actually, I don't know everything. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I've been a bit of a, I was about to swear, but I'm going to try not to swear. Um, <laughs> I've got a potty mouth. I've got a potty mouth. <laughs> me too. I'm not going to invite me back to anything if I start swearing. Okay. So I, when we realise how damaging or how harmful or behaviours um, can be, um, the moment we start to do that, we start to disrupt something in ourselves. It is really useful, though, when we connect that in those individual harms that we might enact to the systems of power, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, so till I, and, and, I'm, and I'm speaking a lot about disability because I also think there is this kind of way in our feminist movement that, you know, disability rights just don't get talked about unless mm -hmm. it's by women with disabilities, disabled women, right? So mm -hmm. for me, that has had me think over a number of years, well, what's my accountability there? But when I think about that, this isn't just me, this is actually what systems do I contribute to, right? What systems am I helping to hold in place? Mm -hmm. How is my behavior directly linked to power systems that actually declare which bodies are the right bodies, for example, which minds are the right kind of minds, which knowledge production is the right type of knowledge production, mm -hmm. which ways of speaking are the right ways of speaking, and, and e examining the ways that I actually can and continue to benefit from, but also contribute to. Right. Because the benefiting from is one thing, right? Like people go, I can't be responsible for what my ancestors did. I'm like, why not? <laughs> you can change it. <laughs> Thank you. You can change it. In this moment, you can start to do something different with it. And also something about solidarity, meaning that we're gonna be doing this for as long as we are alive. This is lifelong work. There's not gonna be that moment where we've done dusted and sorted or white privilege or, you know, kind of privilege in terms of anything else. And so let's just be prepared to be in this struggle for a while. I agree. You touch a little bit on, on, on um, enabling. Uh, that's one thing I have. I have major issues with is it's, it's it happens. You mentioned it uh, in in relation to women with disabilities. It also um, women of foreign origin they experience it. You know, everyone's going to save us, and we're an ad hoc. You know, let's get their voices. You know, they're decorated with you know what what they think, or you know what I mean. And it's and, and enabling is just it's a dangerous thing. And I, I, I don't know <laughs> if it connects to colonialism, but you see it. You yes. know, hey, you know, let's 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 roll Nicole out. She's she's one of them. <laughs> you know, every once in a while. And it's just in order to change the systems and and make that and have that solidarity, you, you got to throw enabling off the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I would absolutely say that that kind of beneficiary dynamic is rooted in colonialism and in the development kind of industry the international development industry and so forth so it's this idea of you cause harm and then you and you exclude and then you help some people out and that's what you do you help them out so you you do that thing of we've been really generous you don't change the system what you do is you offer some scraps in order to demonstrate that you're contributing to empowerment. Mm -hmm. And that thing that you said, Nicole, about empowerment and where empowerment comes from, and you know, the kind of that it has to be with us 100%, but it also has to be with systemic change. Yep. Like, if not, then it ends up with this neoliberal, you know, like I've helped out or I've created an empowerment pathway for that, for Nicole over there, or for Mara I over there, but I've not actually changed the system. Right. You know, like there, you know, and, and so like, like you, I'm like, I want to be able to speak for myself. I don't want anybody to speak for me and think they're gifting empowerment to me. Mm -hmm. But I also want the system to be dismantled because I don't want to have us doing this seven generations from now. I don't want my yeah. great, great grandchildren to be in the same conversation about border control, about wealth, about militarization, about gender-based violence. I, like, I want us to actually have evolved as a species, right? So, and we're not gonna do that if, it, if we don't have widespread system change. Definitely. Do we have any questions? I feel like I'm hogging you for myself. <laughs> um, I don't see anybody on the chat. In Zoom, ah, uh, Maria Ruth says, hi, Giti, I have a question which I would appreciate if you could ask. Absolutely. Um, I don't know what the idea was about how to proceed with questions. So I just want to send it to you. Um, Maria, please just send it to me. I thought I was reading out your question, but I just read out your comment instead. Just uh, send me the question or if 
yeah, I think that that would be great. Just put it into the chat. Um, yeah, I just, un, until um, I had a question, it's flown out of my head. I've been thinking of so many things while you're both talking that the whole thing has flown out of my head. Erg. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay, Geekly. It was a very deep, why. important question. It's now vanished from my <laughs> brain. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know, I just, I just really believe like, like here in Iceland, um, there, there was done um, research. So, so, you know, um, I'm the first woman of foreign origin in over 50 years to run a government agency. Uh, I don't know what that means to the outside of the world, but that's, uh, that's an option to changing the system, to doing things differently. But uh, the first woman of foreign origin in over 50 years, what? <laughs> I thought we've been in a battle. I thought we've been doing things. And, and when, you, when you look at the different, because in, in Iceland, the reason I talk so much about systems is, is we're very systematic, very government, whether it's uh, federal or, or at the local levels, many of our services and things like that are done. And we just need more representation and not representation, you know, in the, in the sense of a peacock, but, you know, the women who are, are afforded jobs, that they're afforded power with that job and that they're, they, they get in there and they get in there with their hammer and their screwdriver and they just go at it. That's, uh, that's what I want to see. I want to see, you know, it's not just dismantling, it's putting in new tools and, Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and being having the power to say this just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, thank you. That actually brings me to Paula Gold's question. She says, what's the biggest thing Iceland needs to self-reflect on and fix? Is it the court system? Is it cultural? What can we do? I've also remembered my point. So I will make that once one of you has taken this on. <laughs> Perhaps mm -hmm. you, Nicole, first? Um, all of it. <laughs> Uh, definitely, um, we have to be able to, if we go back to what we were talking about in looking inside, the uh, most important thing that we need to do is, is to look inside and, and see, you know, what's working well, what's not working well, be honest about, about the exclusions and the different things, uh, listen to the, you know, listen to what we said at Me Too and, and say again and again and again when anyone talks to immigrants and um, <coughs> reflect upon it. Uh, do something, you know, and I don't know when you say re reflect, I, I don't really think we need to do too much more reflection. We just need to start acting because uh, there's some of the same things that I'm saying now, I would have said 20 years ago, same things, you know, all the research, it comes out again and again and again. Uh, for example, language, every research that comes out, foreigners ask for more adequate language instruction, access to language, access to language related to work, just do it. <laughs> and yeah, I don't and know. I mean, you can look at it at all the different systems, all the different levels, but representation and, and taking action. I mean, isn't that the, the answer? Can, yeah. I, can I maybe add something to that as well, Nicole? Mm -hmm, um, I, so, I, yeah, I think that it does help to know where the gaps are, but I think that thing that Nicole pointed out um, of the research and the evidence, and there's a way when harm is being caused that the people that are harmed are constantly required to evidence their harm. It's like, let me show, can I show you my wound over and over and over mm -hmm. again? Can I keep showing you my wound? Oh, you don't believe it's that wound. Oh, maybe, maybe it's over there or I will only accept that that's the wound if I actually study the wound myself. So if you tell me that it's painful, I'm not really going to believe you, right? right? Or I'm going to tell you that you're not objective. No shit. Um, so there's something <laughs> about the, the point at which we're not just focusing on building the evidence base in order to initiate the change, that the change is actually happening, that it's happening on on every possible level. So yeah. I would say your court system is one place, 100%. But there are also kind of cultural um, points that involve actually what, what's your media doing? Like what is happening around yeah. the way that you build awareness in your school system? What is happening about the way that you build awareness in your sports spaces? What is happening about the way that you do that work on like every possible level of society because that's how you create the change. 
Exactly. You can do the stuff within the court system and within legal frameworks, but if you do it within the legal framework and you don't do work around the culture that surrounds it, then actually what you do is you end up with really brilliant laws that aren't being um, enacted or aren't being put into place on a day-to-day basis. And you end up with resentment yeah. around the laws rather than application of the legal framework. And accountability runs out the window. No one's accountable because yeah. it's written in law, but if no one acts it, I mean, it's interesting that you bring up the media. We just had a conversation where one of the major media things looked to us to know what, what can we do as a representation? You know, look at what you're reporting, look at how you report it, look at the access you have to the different cultural inlets. Instead of, you know, you know, looking for clickbait regarding, oh, you know, one of the foreigners did this. Talk about one in 50,000 foreigners did this and talk about the other 49 in a different respect. It's, it's, it's all there, it's at every level. Um, I actually do have uh, Maria Ruth's uh, question. She says, I like being uncomfortable in the sense of keeping myself in check. However, mm. there are areas which I struggle with. Mm. It is when I feel like I have adjusted my thoughts, behaviors, and actions when I come to the point where I feel like there is more to be done, but I don't know where to step down. I don't want to be stagnant, so I wonder if we have a more inclusive and intersectional space uh, in use that can help us to keep checking ourselves. I think it's um, it's more a comment that maybe you could give your thoughts on. Um, I'll let you go I, first. I would, <laughs> yeah, I would say that when it starts to feel comfortable, then we should probably know that we're settling into I know the thing right? This thing is familiar. Um, and so it means that there, there have to be places, like you said, I mean, it's a challenge because you don't want to play out. None of us wants to play out or internal inquiry or, or, or general inquiry on the bodies and the lives of those that have been harmed. So mm -hmm. like, to be, to be really honest, like I'm a black queer woman. When people want to study queerness, black queerness, and they, they want to study me, I'm like, no, thank you. This is why you have Dr. Google. Just like, please do some of that work, right? So I, I think there is something around the level of research that we are willing to do, and also the spaces that we are physically in or emotionally in that help us to sharpen or focus on issues that don't, don't directly affect us. Um, that's kind of what, what I would like, who is your beloved, always like, who is your beloved community? If your beloved community is only people that are um, uh, experiencing the same privilege and have the same power as you, then it means that you're probably like, you're, you're sinking to homogeneity. It will just happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it will hold you in a place of, not in, of, of, of very little challenge. Mm -hmm. I have actually a very specific question and we're kind of running out of time, but I did want to say it. I think, Nicole, this might be for you. Uh, it's from Montserrat Ar Arlet. Sorry if I've mangled your name horribly. Uh, she says, where can I get support about a racist event at work? Um, your unions. Uh, definitely, you can look to the unions and we have something called the Yapratistova, the Equality um, Center. Uh, which you can find. Uh, I, I know, and I, I know you. I can send you a link, but you can look to them for guidance. Uh, you're, if, if it's at work, it's definitely a union thing. And in Iceland, we, we do have some really good unions, but there's also the Equality um, Center, and they can provide you with um, legal, the legal. What do you say? Guidance. Okay. Um, I. Uh, you know, we're, we have like three minutes more to go and I don't want to hog the time. Um, I did want to say that when you mentioned the C word, Marai, it's something that I bring up occasionally here in Iceland because this is how, how the colonial project works. I think in Iceland, we've forgotten that Iceland has been colonized for actually more centuries than most of Asia and Africa have. Um, but we <laughs> don't tend to see ourselves, I mean the Icelandic, as post-colonial 
or having been colonized and it's part of the the intersection of race and and you know nation where since now it's so much part of Scandinavia Europe it's not seen as having been colonized or even in fact desperately poor a hundred years ago um, and so it's just I, I just thought it was interesting you know the way that this whole process of colonial othering happens where this entire history is almost just irrelevant actually to so much of the ways in which Iceland positions itself and brands itself. Um, just quick last words. Oh, Flavia says, do we need borders? I think this has caused more discrimination. Um, I'm not sure that you can get to this in the two minutes we have left, but sure. Either of you. I'll let you go Nicole? first. <laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> I, I started. I think, <laughs> I think borders are inherently problematic because I think that they, unless what we do is we suddenly say all the countries that have been oppressed and marginalized in the geopolitical South maintain borders to stop people from the geopolitical North coming in and actually just harvesting and extracting even more. Yeah. That would be an interesting play on the border dynamic. I think borders are inherently problematic and are rooted in racist systems and structures. So I think that that might give you a sense of where I lean Flavia, on the border situation. No, I'm completely there with you. And I, and I take it a little bit further than I, I, I mean, <laughs> coming from the States and the whole wall thing, I, I honestly believe that people, <laughs> you, you know, like, no, I said it. <laughs> Utilize the idea of like, of these borders that they've created to create so many other borders. They just come in so many forms. You know, it's like, it's, and, and I still we talk a lot about um, when we come here, we don't maybe know the rights and things like that. Those are, those are borders. They box you in. They're different yeah. type of borders. And then there's those unwritten things that's, you know, like I said, that, you know, people are going to empower, they're going to empower me by telling me how I should do things, how they think I should do things. There are all these, you know, there's literal borders. They, they stink because of the fact that there are so many other borders created around them. Um, you know, people want to argue that we need them for trade and we need them for this. We don't need them. You know, we need we need a world Great. that where we you know quit enabling. We we have empathy. We we you know we challenge ourselves. We learn. We grow. You know we're queer. We're black. We're white. We're whatever. And the borders they just they're not used to let those things define us. Absolutely. All borders are just another defining term. Get rid of what, it. What she said. <laughs> and can I just add something about the irony Absolutely. of the U.S. administration? Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the stuff about the wall. That's indigenous <laughs> land. The United States is like it's occupying yeah. indigenous land. So when all the, the, the tribes, all of the First Nation people decide that they're going to create some borders, maybe I'll be interested in those. But how dare people on <laughs> occupied land talk about keeping other people out? I just want to kind of point out that it's upside yeah. down. I want to add to this, Ellen, I know that we're going over time, um, but I just wanted to add to this the fact that that um, if you were if you were to if you were to build a wall, right, that would keep that would keep what <laughs> keep what out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would keep who out. Um, it would it would be around people who are already in reservations. And where would we build these walls? You know, the idea that you can, that if, if, you, if you want to build a wall, you have to have a sense of mine and yours. And it, where would we even begin to establish that in order to start having these borders? I have a couple of, of questions slash comments here that I'm going to mention, and then we really need to wind up, uh, sadly, because this is such an exciting conversation. Um, uh, Angelique says, where are the willing men who want to change? And she doesn't see a lot of men here. I think Yeshi is here. And if it's the Yeshi, I think it is, then he's a man. Uh, but absolutely the point is taken. She said, there are only women on this talk. Where are the men who, the willing men who want change? Um, and Frida says that it saddens me to see how few Icelandic women are attending this great lecture. Um, so there is that. I think the minute you add gender, only women show up because men are not a gender. No, they're not a gender, right? They're a border. <laughs> <laughs>
I didn't say that. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> out loud, <laughs> Nicole. <laughs> that was almost a swear word. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry that we have to end here. Um, but this will go up as a recording. And I think that it's very possible to carry on this conversation and comments and, and you know, in that section, it would be a shame not to be able to do that. Um, so I want to thank both of you for being absolutely brilliant, <laughs> making us think in so many different ways, so many important different ways. Um, and I think what's really amazing about this conversation is that it's taken the very particular, very specific, very detailed practical things and tied them with the big ideas and, and larger historical issues. Um, so yes, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. And thank you everyone thank you. who's participating here. It was lovely to have you all in the room. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, June, I'll see you, sis. I'll see you. you. Thank if you. you would like to stay on for a little bit, after we're done with the recording. Eileen, I leave that up to you. I want to see June, June. There you are. <laughs> ah! <laughs>